So the first talk uh, this morning for the local wildlife sites virtual symposium uh, is Jess Smallcomb from Devon Biodiversity Records Centre. And Jess is going to be talking to us about how or if community science support can support a county wildlife sites framework in Devon. So looking forward to hearing this, Jess. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, first of all, who are DBRC? Uh, we're one of national network of local environmental record centres. Um, we've been going for more than 20 years. Um, we currently have about 7.4 million records in our database and we add by a few thousand every month. Um, all our records are validated and verified and amongst the things we do, we lead on our County Wildlife Sites programme for Devon. So uh, Kieran's already mentioned this, what is a County Wildlife Site? Um, called uh, Local Wildlife Sites, Sinks, various other names. Um, we call them County Wildlife Sites here in Devon. Um, part of a national initiative started in the 90s. We have the wonderful figure of 2,222 at the moment. Um, which totals 30,000 hectares. So we're, we are on par with the national percentage for how much it covers um, of Devon. Um, county wildlife sites are really great for sort of representing what is going on um, across the, the habitats. Uh, most of our county wildlife sites are owned by private landowners. Uh, we have a bit of a cutoff point for 0.5 hectares in size, so they, they really need to be more than that to, to qualify. Um, but even these small sites can be some of the, the most stunning habitats that we have. So how are new ones designated? So although it was all started back in the, the 90s, we have been adding to the number of county wildlife sites. They're flagged up to us through a variety of different mechanisms. Um, but we need to make sure that they meet a really strict criteria that we have. Um, if anyone's interested, we have that criteria on our website. Um, we have about 4,000 of these unconfirmed wildlife sites in our um, database. So there, there are loads more than um, the current county wildlife sites. Um, we go and survey them with our own um, field team. And that's what we've been doing for the last so 10, 10 plus years. Uh, when we've been to see them, um, if they sort of meet the criteria, um, then we put them to an expert panel that we organise each year and they decide if, if they'll be designated or not. Um, and what we need to do is we need to try and find a balance between designating new sites and also going to the existing county wildlife sites to monitor them as well. So how do we do that monitoring? Um, much the same way, um, we have a biodiversity monitoring framework, um, which only just refer as a BMF, um, and that's funded by Devon Wildlife Trust, Devon County Council and ourselves. And what the main objective is to go and gather the condition data for our existing county wildlife sites. We go and our field team goes and does an extended phase one survey um, because Devon is an enormous county, um, some of our sites can be quite large, quite far away, um, and sometimes a mosaic of habitats that can make them quite complex. Uh, so it can take quite a lot of time. Uh, we try and make efficiencies where we can um, to go and look at sites that are all near each other or under the same land ownership. Um, but we have loads of different types of habitats, um, and that includes some quite awkward ones. We have two coasts. Uh, so salt marsh um, reservoirs, sometimes we need to access them by boat. Um, so they can be a bit awkward. Here's a map of our county wildlife sites. Um, they're in the, the dark green. Um, the so paler grey green are the triple SIs in Devon. Uh, so they are much larger sites. Um, so the Dark green county wildlife sites make up about 30,000 hectares and the triple SIs make up about 47,000 hectares and it's a bit over 2,000 sites compared to just over 200 sites um, so they are much much larger the triple SIs. Um, our largest county wildlife site is about 740 hectares and that is the, uh, the dark valley down here. But the county wildlife sites play a really vital role in identifying um, 
there's sort of high quality habitat around the triple SIs, um, which can act as a really important stepping stone um, and just generally to support and buffer those, those sites. These are our unconfirmed wildlife sites. Um, so they are scattered all the way across the county um, where we've got big gaps, that's our triple SIs. Um, altogether, these make up another 35,000 hectares. So we have the potential to double the number of county wildlife sites if we could go and visit 4,000 of these. Um, we've got 8,000 hectares in North Devon, nearly 7,000 hectares just in East Devon. So there are a lot of um, sites that we, we could add. Um, I think you can spot some of these, uh, the tributaries um, from our rivers, got the X and the X. So I, uh, here's a few stats. I haven't put in all 14 years because I don't think that uh, you need to see so many numbers. Um, but I thought I'd just let you know what's going on. Um, first of all, just to explain, um, we split the sites into three different conditions. So red condition is um, that it's that the site itself is in an unfavorable condition and it's being unfavorably managed. Um, the amber condition is either unfavorably managed but in quite good condition or the other way around so in a poor condition but quite favorably managed so generally that means that the site is either getting worse or getting better um, and then green condition is what we like to see where it's in a good condition and um, it's being well managed so what we're trying to do when we go and visit our county wildlife sites is to see what is happening with the with the priority habitats um, we do recognize it's a really small snapshot each year that we can manage to to go and see so as you can see the number of sites that we survey um, from our 2000 um, existing ones or our 4000 that we'd love to add is very very small uh, we've got a couple of anomalies so this year um, 17 to 18 um, we trialed a different survey approach that was a rapid assessment um, and we kind of access some sites using public sites of way. Um, but although we did manage to get around more sites, um, we had some issues with um, whether the data was enough to be able to actually actually designate a county wildlife site. <coughs> Excuse me. And in some cases, also the legitimacy of how that data was collected was also questioned. So in the following year, we went back to the, the, the more traditional um, so thorough surveys. Um, although, of course, that meant that we couldn't do as many. <coughs> um, coming down, we uh, dropped. Obviously, there was the, the COVID pandemic that hit at the start of survey season. So um, some of these were reduced. And um, I'll explain why they, they, they've sort of stayed lower, particularly last year. Um, we have a couple of anomalies as well. So you can see the green condition. Um, this looked like it was just a really good year, only 2% in red condition. And that can be explained because um, of the nature of the different types of site that we go and see. So that year we didn't have very um, a good response from landowners. Um, so we had to go to a lot of sort of open access sites and many of those are woodlands and woodlands tend to be in a slightly better condition than, than grasslands and some of the other habitats um, just because they, they, they change more slowly. Um, whereas if you see last year, um, there were a lot of bad uh, ones in red condition and um, very few that were good. And that's because we saw a lot of um, grasslands last year. And obviously last year was not, not a great year for, for grasslands. It was also so dry. Um, so we didn't manage to, to see quite so many and um, just the, the nature of the habitats that we, we were looking at. Um, so these are the, the sort of overall and that's by site, although if we do the statistics by hectare, the numbers are actually very similar. They only vary by one or two percent for each category. So uh, I've explained about one trial we tried to, to do something a bit different. Um, it didn't work. So uh, the following year we trialled uh, working with our first community group. Um, from a group called Chudley Wild. Chudley is a few miles south of Exeter. Uh, we use local citizen surveyors um, to go and look at um, unconfirmed wildlife sites that we already knew about. Um, we asked them to identify landowners. Uh, we gave them some resources. 
um, but we weren't able to give them very much direct support. Um, we had a few issues. So firstly, we assumed that if people lived in the area, they would know who owned various bits of land around them. Um, turns out they, they didn't. Um, many of the people were actually sort of, they, they'd moved there uh, later in life and they weren't familiar with, with um, all different landowners around them. Um, they're also all volunteers. And although some of them were fantastic um, local experts, um, and really willing to undertake the surveys. They had so many other pressures on their time that um, of the 60 sites that we targeted, um, we actually only managed to get 11 of them fully surveyed over two years. Uh, also because we'd asked them to get in touch with the landowners, um, there were some issues around, around getting survey permissions and uh, using volunteers, the data quality was also um, not quite as, as high as, as we would do um, as our field team. So we had to have a rethink. How can we get around more sites? Um, but we need to do it slightly differently. Uh, we'd like to obviously monitor the existing sites, but try and add to those as well. The community survey model is, is kind of sound as its base, but we needed to make some changes. So one of those was around landowner access permission, and another one is being able to support those volunteers properly. Uh, so learning from the lessons from previous trials, um, we created the community ecologist role. Uh, so I came on board in early 2020. And that's part of my role is to be able to dedicate that time to local groups and individuals. We've also redirected some of our funding for the BMF just towards this trial so that it can support um, my time and some equipment to really be able to um, support those volunteers properly. We're working with a few parishes and each parish hopes to have um, so one wildlife warden per parish um, that can be able to, to do um, surveys like, like we're training them to do. Um, so we have provided training in person and some online sessions as well so that they can cover everything they need to do out in the field and in report writing. So one of the um, groups that we've been working with is called Action on Climate in Teambridge. Teambridge is quite a large district. It's got about 50 parishes within it. It includes Chudley, actually. Um, so it's all just south of Exeter, um, sort of in a, a section between Dartmoor and um, the, the coast. Uh, they started in 2019. We've been working with them. So we were working up to the point where um, at the beginning of last year, we started um, running some workshops with them. Uh, we asked for people who already had good botanical identification. We asked them just to, to, to tell us how, how good they, they thought they were, or how confident they were. Um, and many of them turns out have been or still are professional ecologists, as well as dedicated amateurs. So we had some really, really good skills within the group. Um, we created bespoke survey forms to make sure that um, they could gather all the information that they needed when they were out in the field. Um, we loaned them some equipment that we purchased uh, specially and um, the training sessions, as I mentioned, was, was uh, they included how to survey out in the field and that's woodlands and grasslands. We didn't go for the all 40 types of habitat. We just stuck with the two um, ones that, that are most likely that they'll come across. Um, how to spot indicator species and um, also how to produce the short report. And again, our report, we did it as a kind of template, one that made sure that um, we'd have all the information that we needed when we needed to put, put it to the panel um, to see if it could be designated county wildlife site, but also flexible enough that um, the surveyors could add everything that they, they thought was needed, um, even if they weren't quite sure where it should go to make sure that they had the opportunity to do that. So we've been working with them um, for a while, but only really started the training at the beginning of um, 2022. Um, but through last summer, uh, we had a couple of other groups who said they were interested. So that includes the wildlife wardens in Mid Devon and a parish in North Devon as well. So the Mid Devon group, um, we decided to focus on woodlands. That seems to be the predominant um, habitat type for the, the couple of parishes that are starting with the trial. Um, with that group and the North Devon group 
um, have had both both sorts of training sessions for woodlands and grasslands that we're focused on. So we have made some changes. So we have, um, as DBRC, we have approached all the landowners. Um, we've asked for help to identify who owns what land again. Um, and we've had mixed results with that as, as we kind of expected from previous trials. Um, but coming through us with official letters, make sure that everything is completely legitimate. Uh, when we get a positive response from a landowner, um, we pass their details on, obviously with their permission, to the volunteer, and we ask them to arrange the survey time between them. Uh, then they do the survey, we offer them support all the way through, and then they submit a report at the end. Um, anything that we can't get around this year, we go to next year, and volunteers receive ongoing support. Um, obviously, the landowners have somewhere to come to as well. So in two years, um, last year we managed six sessions just with ACT, so that was four um, in person and a couple online. This year we've got the three groups, so we've already done eight sessions and you know we're, we're middle of July, so we're um, mostly the way through, but we haven't quite finished this, this season yet. Um, so we've got our three groups and we've had nearly 60 attendees on our training sessions to date. Um, the benefits are, well, I mean, this first one, as I've said, is a little bit mixed, um, is the, the local relationships. But we have had um, at least one site that has been designated as a county wildlife site that wasn't even on our system before, but was known by um, some of the volunteers who live locally um, and they surveyed it and it did qualify. So that's fantastic. That's what we would love to see happen with this trial. Um, we're hoping that returns will increase each year as more people get trained. Um, we can reach out to different areas um, across Devon as well to really sort of stretch those numbers. Um, we have finite funding for this each year. So to be able to try and survey as many sites as possible, this is a, a really good way of doing it if we can, if we can make it all work. Um, People understand the importance of these sites and it's always fantastic to be able to share um, skills and knowledge um, with these groups. We do have continued challenges um, as with, with any project like this. Um, so making sure that the data is of a good enough quality um, means that we need to really hold on to um, those experienced surveyors who want to help us. Um, but it can be difficult to, to find them and then to be able to donate their time at, you know, during the summer months, um, where in the past we've discovered that um, quite a lot of people um, disappear for a lot of the summer um, and aren't able to go and survey. Um, and with our training sessions, we can increase skills, but we can't really get them up to um, professional standard in a couple of sessions, which is why we ask for people to be already good botanists. Um, and where we can, we try and match our good botanists with people who are really enthusiastic to go out as a team. And then that's great for sharing skills. Um, the staff time is a huge investment. So we need to have a return on that um, investment. We need to make sure that the um, number of sites we're seeing is the same as would be if just the DBRC team went out or more. And the issue we're seeing at the moment is we're not quite meeting that bar yet. So last year, last year was very difficult. The um, heat burned everything to a crisp and made it really difficult for um, volunteers who maybe weren't quite confident enough in their own skills yet, although many of them were really, really good surveyors. Um, so we're hoping that, that we see a better return this year. Um, we're trying really hard to make it work. Um, Direct interaction with the landowners um, really helps in bringing these sites into positive management. Um, they're doing it because it's all non-statutory most of the time, they're doing it kind of from the heart and um, really kind of making, making a positive difference without it being sort of enforced or um, being a, a government scheme. Um, the data that we get from these surveys underpins our habitat layers. Um, which are really important for things like strategic planning and also um, bigger initiatives. So the local nature recovery strategies or biodiversity net gain. But all our funding is local. So that's, you know, that our council, Devon Wildlife Trust and ourselves, um, central government doesn't 
um, contribute anything to, to these surveys currently. So in the future, um, well, I think it goes back to, to um, the issue with um, the funding as, as much as anything. Um, it's all been locally funded for the last, well, quite a few years. Um, and that's dropping in real terms. So by using our wonderful volunteers, we're hoping to try and maximise how much that funding can, can reach. Um, but it's not currently, I know we're only halfway through our second year, um, but it's not currently returning what is required. So we're hoping to see a, a, an uptake um, this year that means that we can keep it going. Um, we have constraints in our data. Uh, we need to charge for it. Uh, but um, we need to recover our costs to make sure that we can do any of this at all. Um, so it would be lovely if we had some um, central government um, funding from, from DEFRA or somewhere that can uh, help us to create a bigger partnership and ensure that this work continues and continues to have an impact. So thank you very much. Um, there's a um, link that um, maybe Kieran will be able to put in the chat as well about um, where you can find our County Wildlife Site um, criteria. And if you'd like to get in touch, um, I've popped um, DBRC manager Ian, um, his email on there. Thank you.